Benchmark, the voice of business. Presented by LMD. On this edition of Benchmark, will Sri Lanka's battered global image weigh heavily on export markets? We get the apparel industry's view from the CEO of Stretchline and Managing Director of MAS Fabric Cluster, Timothy Spaldewind. Then, Kira Mechen, Country Manager of TNS Lanka, analyzes the results of the nationwide poll on predictions for 2013. And finally, LMD columnist and market analyst Hasta Premaratna discusses how rising interest rates could affect market sentiment. That's the lineup for Benchmark. Hello and welcome to Benchmark, the Big Picture Business Program. I'm Savitri Rodrigo. Sri Lanka's credibility as well as her image suffered quite a loss. In fact, hit rock bottom recently with the removal of the Chief Justice. Now, this is a step seen by many commentators as moving Sri Lanka dangerously close to a dictatorship. Already there are calls for Sri Lanka's suspension from the councils of the Commonwealth and the fact that we are hosting the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting in November, that too stands in abeyance. Now, what does this mean for our economy and the solely needed foreign direct investment as well as our exports? An industry that accounts for around 40% of Sri Lanka's exports, the apparel industry, has had to contend with the suspension of the GSP Plus three years ago. Um, will the industry's resilience be tested once again? or what is the way forward. To add some light and to give his perspective uh, on this as well as other issues on the apparel industry is Timothy Speldewin, the CEO of Stretchline Holdings and Managing Director of the MAS Fabric Cluster. Can you just give me a little bit of a brief overview of Sri Lanka's apparel industry as it now stands? Okay, uh, I think 2012 has been one of the best years for the tourists, for the, uh, for the industry, for the garment industry as a whole. Uh, MAS achieved its biggest revenue and turnover in uh, 2012. So did a lot of the others. So I think the uh, apparel industry is on a very, very strong footing right now. There have been a lot of calls for the apparel industry to have more value addition. Now, Many of our apparel manufacturers, though I must add, have offered speed, flexibility, they provide fully integrated services like yourselves. However, does this mean that, is, that the entire apparel industry is within this equation or is it just a few? Uh, it is a few. It is still a few, but a few big boys, uh, big companies that really matter and that have, I would say, the 80-20 rule. 20% 20 of the industries are responding but it's 80% of the garment revenue uh, into the country from the garment side. Um, speed, innovation, design, development has been Sri Lanka's success. And it is definitely one of our niche that we can market today. How would you rate the uh, levels of research and development in the apparel industry the way it now stands? We are far behind still. We are far behind. I think Hong Kong, China have huge advantages compared to what Sri Lanka has, uh, purely because the fabric and trims and accessory business has grown years ahead than what we have. We got into fabric integration and the supply chain only in the last really 10 years. And that too, it has been more focused on the intimate apparel side. So the other, other garment sector has moved out of this country. The intimates have grown. Um, so we are limited in uh, resource on innovation, but we are happy with uh, Slintec that is just down the road in Biagama, uh, a nanotechnology uh, division set up by the government uh, private sector partnership, looking at taking us to different levels with nanotechnology. But on the innovation side, uh, the fabrics really need more innovation. Uh, elastics are there in a bigger way, in a better way, already in, in there. But fabrics, trims, um, foam, uh, really not there. 
uh, it's still, still a lo long way to go. In 2010, Timmy, the GSP Plus facility was suspended by the EU, uh, primarily over Sri Lanka's human rights record. Now, the government has been urged, or should I say encouraged, to reapply for the facilities, of course, based on the progress of the LLRC recommendations. Do you think the industry growth is actually being stunted uh, to some degree by the perceptions of the West and also the country's human rights track record? Certainly not. Uh, everybody was very, very nervous when GSP went out three years ago. Yes, there was a little blip. The cheaper garment makers, European garment makers moved out into Bangladesh, a lot went into China. Today they are all back. All the Chinese companies or the English companies that set up in China have all come back to Sri Lanka. They are buying four or five factories each, bringing their intimate apparel. Because the cost of labor in China has gone up so much, the appreciation of the RMB has gone up. Bangladesh has had its fair shares of trouble, quality is really not there. The intimate apparel business in this country has grown since the takeaway of the GSP. And where human rights are concerned, I'm sure all our buyers know the people in the factories have absolutely no problem. They're well treated, they're well um, fed, they're clothed, and they really have a good lifestyle. So there is no human right problems where the factories are concerned, in my opinion. You were very right in saying that the apparel industry has grown significantly. I mean, it started as a $0.2 billion industry, and today it rakes in something like $4 billion annually. Now, the combined export earnings, if I'm right, uh, of the big players, the members of the Sri Lanka Apparel uh, Association accounts for 70% of our export earnings. Do you believe in the light of what is happening and the fact that the Eurozone is not doing too well and nor is the U.S., that $5 billion target is realistic? It's tough. It is tough. Uh, it is purely because Europe is in bad recession. Europe used to take a considerable amount out of Sri Lanka. You can see the companies that were only Europe-centered have lost a lot of orders. Business has gone down. So uh, it is going to be tough. We might get to $5 billion, but not in the time scale. Uh, it might take two, three years longer because uh, the growth has to come out of Asia. And we see a lot more exports going out of Sri Lanka into, even into China, right? Into Indonesia, into the Philippines. Asia is developing. India is a market that we have not tapped yet. And India is, uh, is looking for good quality garments. So uh, definitely the growth, part of that growth to 5 billion will come in the region. And that's the market we need to target because Europe is going to stay flat or less. Uh, so five billion is, at the moment, a little, little tough to get to. Time for a short break now. But when we come back, Timmy Spelderwin talks about rising production costs, falling product prices, and emerging trends, among other issues. Stay with us. When we entered the industry in 1995, a new star was born as a fully owned subsidiary of People's Bank. For those seeking to grow their businesses, PLC provided the seed. We are not only Sri Lanka's number one leasing company, but also the largest non-banking financial institution. Welcome to a new dawn for the nation. Introducing People's Leasing and Finance, PLC. Hello and thank you for staying with us on Benchmark. We now return to our exclusive interview with Timothy Speldewin, CEO of Stretchline Holdings and Managing Director of the MAS Fabric Cluster. Um, 
In our second half, I'd just like to ask you, now our apparel industry has progressed from its origins to the original design manufacturing stage and now we are striving to stamp our seal as a leading international original equipment manufacturer supplier to the world. What would you say, hence, would be the emerging trends in manufacturing and how do we shape ourselves to go into these goals? Uh, Sri Lanka is no longer a cut and sew country or a CMT, cut, make and uh, uh, put your trims in. Uh, Sri Lanka is a full package of uh, offerer. So we have to have all the machines, equipment um, and tools to produce this. The lean manufacturing companies today that have adopted lean manufacturing or the origins of which were Toyota manufacturing system have really taken out efficiencies, inefficiencies out of the company. It has taken out waste, it has taken out excess labor, it has taken out space created. So it has really made companies more efficient. And that's the only way Sri Lanka going forward can compete on price and, and uh, delivery compared to the other. So our tool that we, we sell as a group, or Sri Lanka has also adopted a lot, is we are lean manufacturers. We don't have any additional cost involved. So we are able to give you speed, uh, on-time delivery, and uh, a price that is very, very competitive through this initiative. So on the retail front, what are apparel buyers focusing on these days? Maybe you could give us some insights from the MAS group itself. Speed, speed, and speed. There is no other word on their lips. Our chairman goes and meets the chairman of the limited, and he just says, how fast is faster? How can we get faster? It's just, it's just speed. And they recognize Sri Lanka today for that. The customer wants to have, the retailer really wants to have zero write-downs zero stockouts and to be able to read the market and project what he really needs. That he's able to do with a company that can supply him in a week. Earlier they placed three to eight weeks ahead and hope for the best. We've discussed this uh, before, Timmy. The traditional labor cost advantage that we had earlier has seems to be moving out to countries like Vietnam and uh, Cambodia. But at the same time, there are other countries like China, which were considered uh, low labor destinations, which have now upped their prices. But when it comes to Sri Lanka, the debate is this. Do we continue to lower the labor cost or do we increase our pay scales so that we improve the standard of living of our workers? Actually, I would say that in Sri Lanka, most factories pay a living wage. Uh, together with the facilities that are offered, could they save on their breakfast and their lunch, their transport, their clothes, all that is a saving, right? So they, they get, their salary is a living wage. Uh, there is no complaints. We don't have revolts like in, uh, in Bangladesh for pay, uh, where there's, they, they keep asking for more and more and more. We have been giving more than the industry norm, more than the minimum wage, way above the minimum wage. The biggest problem, stretch line, not stretch line, the apparel industry has today is not enough labor. Even if you want to grow, people are slowly but leaving the industry because there are other opportunities. There is new hotels opening up on both coasts in, inside. People can work from home now. There is farming. A lot of people are leaving to start uh, growing vegetables again because there is such a demand with the, with the tourism in, uh, industry moving. Uh, so opportunities to Korea. People are moving a lot. We have a male force. A lot of our guys have started to move out to Korea. So that is the problem. It's not the, it's not the wage or the minimum uh, that they can't live on. It is that they have other opportunities and are starting to look at them. Timmy, cost does remain central to sourcing decisions, whether it's speed, whether it's flexibility, because markets are constantly transforming. Brands are willing to pay premiums for quality and on-time delivery, like you mentioned. So, how can manufacturers compete effectively amid rising production costs and also 
falling product prices? It is a challenge. The good days are gone. Uh, the, the days when you made double digit profit margins are gone. Uh, the, the challenges you have is to be lean, be efficient, deliver on time, where the customer can sleep at night, placing an order with you, they'll keep coming back to you. Price is always a challenge, but when you have your supply chain in your country, you can engineer the price for the customer. Maybe if he gives you a target price, you make your fabric to match that price. He might have to compromise a little bit on uh, the thickness of the fabric or the gauge of the fabric. Same with elastics, with labels, with whatever. You can re-engineer your product when you have your supply chain around you. Earlier we couldn't. You had to just buy what they tell you to buy from outside. So this way you can keep going, but you're right, the, the glory days are over. But it, it's, still, it's still a good industry. So the bigger you get, the more you have. Thank you very much, Timmy, for the exclusive interview you gave to Benchmark. And that concludes that interview. But we have, after this, Kiran H.N., Country Manager of TNA Sri Lanka, followed by Hasita Premaratna, Market Analyst and LMD Columnist. When we entered the industry in 1995, a new star was born as a fully owned subsidiary of People's Bank. For those seeking to grow their businesses, PLC provided the seed. We are not only Sri Lanka's number one leasing company, but also the largest non-banking financial institution. Welcome to a new dawn for the nation. Introducing People's Leasing and Finance, PLC. Welcome back to Benchmark. I'm Nishu Hashim and with me now is Country Manager for TNS Lanka, Kiran Echen, with the latest on the LMD TNS survey. Now Kiran, how do respondents see 2013 panning out? Well, you can't say that uh, uh, people are gung-ho about 2013. Uh, just over 50%, I think anywhere between 55 to 60% of the respondents that we met in the survey feel that 2013 is going to be a great year. Uh, for the country, for them, um, and a similar proportion also believe that economy will be good, it's be, business prospects will be good. Um, so by and large, an optimistic one. The remaining uh, of them are not sure. They're telling it's going to be a mixed setback. Um, you know, so uh, it could be a mix of good and bad things. But the good thing about the survey is that um, the sense of optimism prevails across uh, different sections of the society, uh, be it rich or poor, be it columbor, <coughs> upcountry, rural, um, gender, um, male or female, I think the sense of optimism prevails. That's a good thing. Uh, what's also good is that um, uh, when you look at it by age groups, the youth are a lot more optimistic than the older middle-aged lot. Um, so as I said, by and large optimistic and perhaps a tad realistic too. What have the optimists cited as the key reason for their 2013 outlook? Well, you don't need a reason to be uh, hopeful and optimistic about uh, the future. Uh, but when you do ask them, uh, the biggest reason that seems to be coming around is um, look at the progress around you. Look at the kind of development that you see around you, um, great roads, infrastructure. And I think... Um, what has also pleasantly surprised the public is the speed of this growth. I think post-war, the speed at which uh, all these positive changes that they see around them, I think is fueling this optimism. So I think that's one of the biggest reasons for um, uh, the way they feel uh, this time. Um, the other reasons are also around there. The uh, small but significant lot also talk about the economic progress and they believe that the economy will uh, get better. 
um, a lot of them also mention about how uh, post-war, um, you know, the freedom and peace has been maintained and we are actually growing from that. We are building on that. I think that's a, a good reason. So, but everything revolves around the growth and development uh, in the country that you see around you. And Kiran, what are the top five priorities for this year according to the survey results? The topmost priority unanimously is around um, uh, curbing cost of living. I mean, people are expecting... Uh, rather hoping that, uh, uh, you know, the uh, escalating cost of living price of essential commodities is something that uh, has had really driven them to despair. A couple of months ago, our own poll had indicated that they were quite frustrated and feeling helpless about it. Um, uh, more than anything else, the frequency of these price hikes that, has, that we have seen in 2012 um, and uh, the salary hasn't salary growth hasn't matched up to that. So um, in that context, um, uh, the top most uh, worry or concern for them is cost of living, and they're hoping that there will be some respite on that. Uh, there are also a few other mentions, um, close to around 80% plus, also talk about um, how um, we are on a fantastic growth path. Uh, the speed of this progress should be continued, so they are focusing on um, you know, uh, infrastructure development. Uh, there is also another 80 percent, uh, close to around 80 percent, who mention um, how last year was not a great year for the education system. And hopefully we should pick things up from there and move on. Uh, there is also uh, mentions about uh, health care systems and, um, 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 you know, and uh, security reduction in crimes, etc. Uh, so these are the prevalent themes, but I think the topmost goes to cost of living and how, um, you know, I can make ends meet. Um, and people are, I think, hopeful of uh, some respite on that. That was Country Manager for TNS Lanka, Kiran HN. After a short commercial break, Anushin Selvaraja talks to Hasita Premaratna about the latest situation at the Bose. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Benchmark. I'm Anushan Selvaraja and with me now is market analyst and LMD columnist Hasita Premratna with the latest on the boss. Now, uh, Hasita, the ASPI fell by 162 points in November of last year and showed a, a slight recovery of sorts in December. Now, uh, how has this affected the cash inflows into the market? Yeah, if you look at the month of November, I think uh, it, the, the downward trend that we saw in the month of October continued and uh, there were uh, modest turnover levels that were uh, seen in the, during the months of uh, November and October both. Uh, towards December, we saw the situation changing. In fact, the market picked up about 5.5% during the month of December alone, uh, mainly because uh, uh, there have been some bargain hunting in the market, particularly from the foreign side. Uh, also, the retail participation was uh, uh, there, but the, then the participation was somewhat uh, uh, not so significant in the context of the overall turnover in December. But again, with the holiday mood towards the latter part of the month, uh, December looked to be a slow month overall. So there weren't too much of uh, uh, cash inflows from the domestic side to the market. But from the foreign end, we saw a sizable amount of net inflows coming, coming into the market during the month of uh, December. If you look at the continuation of that trend towards January, we are seeing the market activity gradually picking up, though it's not so significant as yet. Uh, so accordingly, I think the, with the new year starting in 2013 with more uh, inflow with uh, more new funds, fresh funds being available for investment for the different uh, for, for foreign as well as local funds, uh, we might see these fund managers more uh, actively looking at taking bargain hunting opportunities during the coming weeks. Interest rates are rising and uh, have sort of eased off over the last few weeks. Now what sort of impact did this have on the market? Yeah, I think if you look at the interest rate environment, uh, it was very important from a trading perspective in the uh, last maybe one or two years because um, in my view, the market was extremely 
uh, over leverage that is there was too much of borrowed money that was u- that were used to be invested in the stock market uh, whether it was ipo or whether it was uh, uh, normal uh, retail related investments most of the domestic uh, retail in particular the investments that came into the market were driven by borrowed funds so this was uh, getting significantly uh, adversely affected towards the year 2012 because when the interest rate started to pick up in the early 2012 where almost about 4% increase was seen in the interest rates uh, this created a situation where the the, the margin traders uh, the guys who borrow and then invest in the market uh, getting into a bit of a situation because their interest payment monthly interest payment burdens going up and at at to the worry was that the market was not performing too well so as a result uh, we found very clearly that the retailers got stuck and they could not bring in fresh funds so as a result the market movements were somewhat controlled and whenever the market went up a little bit we saw the retail investors coming in and selling so that they can settle back their borrowed uh, uh, positions uh, as well as when the market was uh, coming down there was a bit of uh, uh, forced selling by the by the brokers uh, in order to cover up the margin level so this was a uh, uh, bit of a difficult situation from the market's point of view but i think it has eased off over the year where debt position the leveraged uh, positions have reduced significantly uh, even from for the most of the retail investors though it's not totally over uh, so interest rates going up has been a uh, has been hurting negatively to the market because of this reason now if we had less borrowed funds in the market invested in the market we wouldn't have this much of a negative impact uh, when the rates went up so uh, things are kind of getting better but overall still i would say that the interest rates uh, going up had a negative impact interest rates coming down will have a, a positive impact on the trading side has the uh, last year the market fell by 7% now how did this affect the market valuations yeah if you look at the market valuations i think there are two factors that influence one is how the index has behaved the prices have be- behaved uh, the other thing is how the corporate earnings have uh, responded during the year so when the market fell by about 7% during the year we have seen the corporate earnings improving marginally uh, during the year though uh, the last few years we have seen sizable amount of growth in the corporate earnings in 2012 we've seen uh, Uh, maybe about a 3 to 5% improvement in the corporate earnings as a whole instead of maybe uh, 15 20% that would have uh, ideally been uh, expected maybe a couple of years back uh, for 2012 so this situation was influenced by the economic conditions and the, some of the other developments that took place during 2012 but broadly uh, the corporate earnings marginal improving and the index coming down means that the market price earnings ratio uh, has uh, overall uh, come down Uh, marginally uh, though it's not so significant so that uh, gives uh, more value value for for, uh, for most of the uh, in market in general as well as for selected stocks where we have seen very clearly uh, some counters are trading at relatively low price earnings ratios which means that uh, these stocks need to be carefully looked at by investors because they have the potential to re-rate uh pretty soon because if the corporate earnings for the th- year 13 14 are expected to be stronger uh, some of these counters will will start picking up uh, quite significantly i mean if you analyze you will find fairly a sizable number of stocks which are today trading at about 8 times 7 times pe levels whereas these stocks were trading at about 14 15 times maybe uh, not so far away maybe about 12 to 15 months back so that clearly indicates to us that when the market sentiment turns around and things uh, maybe the economic side turns positive uh, maybe it's a matter of time but with that happening we would see uh, these stocks getting back to a, a price uh, improvement which is where the bargain hunting opportunities exist at this point of time that was market analyst and lmd columnist hasta prem ratna thank you for watching benchmark and we hope to see you again next time